Well, good evening. We're glad that you could be with us tonight. We're uh, continuing to look at the um, book of Genesis. In fact, um, it seems like we just started, and uh, we're already on chapter 46, and we'll be just another week or so, we'll be finished with the book of Genesis. Um, I had a thought of uh, doing the book of Revelation sort of from one end to the other. Uh, I don't know for sure yet, but be in prayer about that, and we we'll, we may just look at the beginning and the ending. I think both are encouraging to know that we came from God and to know through Christ that we can go to him again uh, through what Christ has done. So there is comfort uh, in uh, both Genesis, uh, well, the whole Bible, but in both Genesis and Revelation. So uh, if you have your Bibles, look to Genesis chapter 46, and I'm going to uh, I'm gonna skip around. Um, I won't read the whole chapter, but I will read a few verses uh, on either side of those names. Uh, we have a list, uh, sort of a miniature genealogy, we're going to talk about those names, but we're not. I'm not going to read them all to you. So if you have your Bible, turn to Genesis chapter 46, and we'll begin reading with verse 1. If you remember, um, Joseph has revealed himself to his brothers. Um, he sends them back to Canaan to get Jacob and bring him and all the family and the chapter 46 is the story of that. Um, I'm going to call the message tonight, Living by Faith. Um, we talked about from chapter 37 on, basically, that Genesis is a, uh, Joseph is the main character. But in chapter 30, uh, in chapter 46 here, we do have uh, a little more detail about Jacob. And we're going to look at uh, his, his life here. So, Genesis chapter 46 and verse 1. <clears throat> and Israel took his journey with all that he had. And he came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices unto God, and the God of his father Isaac. And God spake unto Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, Here am I. And he said, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I there, for I will there make of thee a great nation. I will go down with thee into Egypt, and I will also surely bring thee up again. And Joseph shall put his hand upon thine eyes. Jacob rose up from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel carried Jacob their father, and their little ones, and their wives, and their wagons, which Pharaoh had sent to carry him. And they took their cattle and their goods, which they had gotten in the land of Canaan, and came unto Egypt, Jacob and all his seed with him, his sons and his sons' sons with him, his daughters and his sons' daughters, and all his seed brought he with him into Egypt. And we have from verses 8 through about verse 27, um, we have the record of those 70 people that came down into uh, Egypt with Jacob. And then let's pick up at verse 28. Uh, Genesis 46, verse 28. And he sent Judah before him unto Joseph to direct his face unto Goshen. And they came unto the land of Goshen. And Joseph made ready his chariot and went up to meet, his, meet Israel, his father, to Goshen. And presented himself unto him, and he fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. And Israel said unto Joseph, Now let me die, since I have seen thy face, because thou art yet alive. And Joseph said unto his brethren, and unto his father's house, I will go up and show Pharaoh, and say unto him, My brethren and my father's house, which were in the land of Canaan, are come unto me. And the men are shepherds for their um, trade, have been to feed cattle, and they have brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. And it shall come to pass when Pharaoh shall call 
you, you shall say what he, he shall say, what is your occupation? Uh, then ye shall say, thy servant's trade hath been about cattle from our youth, even until now, both we and also our fathers, that ye may dwell in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is an abomination unto the Egyptians. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this man, Jacob, and Joseph, for the children of Israel, for your covenant with them, for your promises to them. Lord, we pray that you would bless us tonight, help us to speak your word, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we look at this story, we see some, I think, some interesting things about Jacob um, that I noticed in this story, and I hope it will be um, a blessing to you and an encouragement to you and maybe a challenge to you. The first thing I notice as we look at this passage is Jacob took all that God gave him. The Bible says in verse 1, Israel took his journey with all that he had. He took everything that God had given him, and he went to Egypt. He took his family. Verse 5 says he came to Beersheba. That's the southernmost part of uh, the land of Canaan in the kingdom years. That's they say from Dan to Beersheba, Dan being the northernmost part and Beersheba the southernmost most part. And so before he leaves Canaan, he sacrifices or makes a sacrifice to God. And, well, we have both Israel, it says, and the sons of Israel carried Jacob, their father, their little ones, their wives, all that they had. Verse 7 says his sons and his uh, grandchildren, his daughters and his granddaughters, all that he had, all of his seed, it says, he brought to Egypt. And then in verses 8 through 27, we have given in order the sons of Leah, uh, the sons of Zilpah, uh, Leah's maid, the sons of Rachel, and then the sons of Bilhah. Rachel's maid, the 12 children, and his daughter Dinah is also mentioned in that list. And we don't know all of these people. We know the names of the 12, but of their children, we don't all know them. Um, but they grew from, well, Jacob. When Jacob was, had left his father-in-law with his family to come back home, the Bible says in Genesis 32 that as he was getting ready to meet Esau, he prayed to God and thanked God because he said, when I came, when I came this way to start with, all I had was my staff in Genesis 32.10. When I came this way, all I had was my staff, and now I'm split up into two groups. I have so much family. Uh, I'm become, he says, two bands, the King James Version. Jacob brought his family, but not only did he bring his family, he brought his fortune. He brought all that he had materially. Verse uh 6 says they took their cattle and their goods and all they had gotten in the land of Canaan and came to Egypt, Jacob and all his seed with him. He brought everything he owned, not just his family, but his material possessions as well. There's an interesting story uh, a few hundred years later in the book of Exodus when God is going to deliver the children of Israel out of bondage, Moses is going to Pharaoh to get him to let the people go. And they go back and forth through the different plagues. And there's a plague of 
darkness. The way the King James describes it sounds horrible to me. A darkness that can be felt. That's dark. And it was after this darkness that, um, well, Pharaoh had tried to get Moses to compromise. Uh, you can leave Egypt, but don't go far. Just go out into the wilderness. And you can leave uh, Egypt and go out to worship God, but don't take your family with you. And then he offers uh, this compromise. Don't take your possessions with you. In Exodus chapter 10, verses 21 through 26, he, um, God sends the plague of darkness and they couldn't tell where they were, but the Bible says all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. And Pharaoh called Moses and said, go ye and serve the Lord and only let your flocks and your herds be stayed. Let your little ones also go with you. So at first, he tried to get them to leave the children there. You didn't want them to get hurt out in the desert. That was Pharaoh's excuse. But then he tells Moses, okay, go ahead, you go. Take your family with you, take your children with you, but leave all your possessions in Egypt. Don't, in other words, don't go all the way. Jesus said we have to be careful with our possessions because where they are, our heart winds, winds up being as well. Leave your flocks and your herds. But Moses said, we have to have something to sacrifice to make an offering to our God. Our cattle also shall go with us. There shall not an hoof be left behind. For therefore must we take to serve the Lord our God, and we know not with what we must serve the Lord until we come thither. Moses took or wouldn't leave without their possessions. Joseph, uh, Jacob took his family, but he also took his possessions as well. If we're going to live by faith, we have to be totally committed, totally surrendered. We have to take everything with us that God has given us, our family, our fortune. Jacob took all that he had and went to Egypt. Jacob took all that God gave him. Jacob believed all that God told him. Now, Abraham and got into trouble going down to Egypt, and God specifically told Isaac not to go to Egypt, but God tells Jacob to go. Go down to Egypt. Don't be afraid to go. I'll go with you. I'll be with you. And not only will I be with you, but I will make a great nation of you. Don't be afraid to go down. I'll be with you. And he even says, I'll bring you back out of the land of Egypt. And then he also says that he will be there long enough that the King James says, Joseph shall put his hand upon thine eyes, which is... Uh, euphemism for you'll be there till you die. Joseph will see your death. He will close your eyes as it were. Um, J Jacob believed God and God knew Jacob. God knows our name. The Bible says that Jacob made an offering to the Lord and God spoke to Jacob. And when he spoke to him, he said, Jacob, Jacob, like God had done with Abraham as he prepared to offer his son Isaac on the altar, the Bible says that Abraham raised, his, raised the knife to kill the child and God said, Abraham, Abraham, stay your hand. Don't hurt the child. Like Martha in the New Testament, Mary sat at the feet of Jesus and 
Luke chapter 10. And Mary was busy. She was having company. She was cooking and cleaning and worrying. And she said to Jesus, make her get up and help me, if you'll forgive my inelegant translation. And Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you're so anxious. You're so troubled about so many things. And he called her by name. Like Saul, when he was the Pharisee, Saul, who hated Christ and everything to do with Christ. And Jesus met him on the road to Damascus and a light shone around him and Jesus spoke to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? God knows our name. As I mentioned before, we don't, we don't know all these people and we wonder sometimes why these long lists are in the Bible. Um, sometimes in Paul's letters, especially in the book of Romans, we have a pretty long list at the end of that book that God uh, inspired, the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write. And these names of people we've never heard of before, but it's because of those people they were used to help Paul in his ministry, and God knows who they are. You may feel insignificant, but God knows your name. God knows our name, and hopefully we'll be like Samuel when he heard a voice and God spoke to him and said, Samuel, Samuel. And hopefully we'll be like Samuel and answer, speak, Lord, for your servant heareth. God not only knows our name, Jacob believed what God told him because God knew him. God knew his name, but God also knew his needs. Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. He knows what we need, and he has given us, if we've trusted Christ, he's given us eternal life. And in case you wonder what that means, it means you'll never perish, he says. I give to them eternal life and they shall never perish. And nobody's able to take us out of his hand. Because we're in his hand and we're in God's hand. Vance Havner said that's having the situation well in hand. We're in Christ's hands and Christ is in God's hands. And no one can pluck us from his hand. God tells Jacob, it's okay, don't be afraid, go on down to Egypt. I'm not just the God of Canaan, I'm the God of everywhere. He says in verse 4, I'll go down with you to Egypt and I will bring you up again. And Joseph shall put his hand upon your eyes. As I said before, that's a a euphemism for Jacob dying. You're going to stay in Egypt till you die. You're not just going to go for the years of the famine. You're going to stay there till you die. But the amazing thing about it is he was going to go down to Egypt and stay till he died, but he was going to come out again. So how do you, how do you stay somewhere till you die and then come out? Well, literally... They brought his body out, Jacob told them, as Joseph did later. When I die, don't bury me in Egypt. Take me back to the cave where Leah is buried and his mother and father and Abraham and Sarah were buried. Take me back to God's promised land. 
and bury me there. But in a, well, in another literal sense, not only would Jacob's body be brought out of Egypt, but over 400 years later, the children of Israel would come out. So in a sense, he came out with them as well. He took all that he had. If we're going to live by faith, we're have, going to have to take all that we have and surrender it to God. If we're going to live by faith, we're going to have to believe God. And then if we're going to live by faith, like Jacob, he stayed where God directed him. Sometimes we are impatient. We think we have to move. We think we have to go somewhere and do something. And if we're where God has called us to be, we don't need to go. We need to stay. Now, if God calls us to go, we need to go. Jacob comes down to Egypt and he says, after he sees Joseph, let me die. I have seen your face. In other words, God's promise has been fulfilled. God told him that you would see Joseph. Joseph is alive and you'll see him. And when that promise is fulfilled, he knows that he's where he's supposed to be. And he is ready to die. As Adrian Rogers used to say, until you're ready to die, you're not really ready to live. Unless you're prepared to die, you can't really live. You can't have the abundant life that Christ gives until you're in Christ. Paul reminds us of that in Galatians chapter 2. He says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Christ died for us, Paul says in Romans chapter 6. Christ died for us, and we're to die to sin, Paul says in Romans 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with Christ, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. If we're dead in Christ, then we can't serve sin because that old man died. Paul says, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon your own selves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ. Jacob, like Simeon, we just talked about him at Christmas time, when God's promise was fulfilled to him, he said, now let your servant depart in peace. It had been revealed to Simeon that he wouldn't die until he saw the Lord's Christ to see the salvation of Israel. And he saw it and he said, I'm ready. I'm prepared. I'm where you want me to be. Whatever you need, whatever you want me to do, I'm here. I'm where you want me to be. I am dead to myself, dead to sin, so that I can live, or that so that Christ can live in me. That's the way we're to live, if you will, as Christians. We have to die to live. We have to die to ourselves, and that's the only way that we can function, if you will, as Christians, is if we 
die to ourselves. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Luke says, daily, and take up his cross and follow me. Well, what do you take up a cross for? A cross is for execution. Paul could say, I die daily. Jacob died when he went to Egypt. Eventually he did. He actually lived 17 more years but he lived in faith. And if we're going to live by faith, we have to die to ourselves, to count ourselves dead, if you will. One of the movies, series, whatever it is, that I like, it has very bad language in it. Uh, I think it was probably accurate. It's about World War II, and I think it was pretty accurately portrayed. The series was called Band of Brothers, and it was about the 101st Airborne Division in World War II. And there was different stories about different people in this particular group. Um, I think it was the 501st Parachute Infantry Division, uh, or Infantry, Infantry Regiment of the 101st Division. But anyway, there was uh, one of the characters in that series that it talked about was a private Blythe, Albert Blythe. And he was not or couldn't function as a soldier. One of the leaders of one of the companies, one of the lieutenants, met him one night as they were preparing for a battle the next day. And he told him, when we parachuted into Normandy on D-Day, I landed in a ditch, and I was by myself. And he said, I don't know if it was those air sick pills they gave us or what, but I just went to sleep in that ditch. And I didn't really get up and look for anybody. I didn't try to find my unit. And the Lieutenant Spears asked him, do you know why you hid in that ditch, Blythe? He said, I was scared. Lieutenant Spear said, we're all scared. He said, you hid in that ditch because you think there's still hope. But Blythe, the only hope you have is to accept the fact that you're already dead. And the sooner you accept that, the sooner you'll be able to function as a soldier is supposed to function. Without mercy, without compassion, without remorse. All war depends upon it. If I could say, our Christian life depends upon it. For us to be dead to ourselves, to count ourselves dead that we might, or that Christ might live in us. That's the only way we can function, to live by faith, to take everything that God has given us and surrender it to him, to believe everything that he has told us, and to live for him to go where he directs us without fear to face our own sinfulness if you will to use lieutenant spears words without mercy without compassion without remorse because if we don't put our sinful self to death our sinful self will put us to death so are we living by faith as Jacob did, as Joseph did. If we are, we'll have to surrender. We'll have to take all that we have. We'll have to believe all that God says. And we'll have to be obedient to where he calls us to go. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you for Jacob and Joseph, the patriarchs, 
we pray that you would help us to live by faith, that we would give, surrender all that we have, that we would believe you, and that we would be obedient to your word. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.